Hey there, Coach Miller here with B2B Lax. I'm in the studio, and today's video is all about college lacrosse recruiting. Specifically, I want to give you five tips to help you navigate the process this summer. Believe me, I know, because I've been coaching lacrosse for a long time, I'm currently coaching at Gonzaga College High School in Washington, D.C., been there for about 10 years, and before that, I coached in college, I played in college, so I know the stresses that college recruiting can cause. We have a lot of guys going to play in college, so I talk to them about it all the time. I still talk to a lot of my buddies in college who were coaches about the process and all the things that it entail. But specifically, today I want to talk about these five things that are going to help you get recruited to play college lacrosse. And the first thing that everybody has questions about is how do I get exposure? And let me give you a little bit of background here. See, before I was coaching at Gonzaga, I was coaching in college. I coached at Georgetown for six years, and before that, I coached at Tufts. While I was at Georgetown, there was two assistants there, Matt Rienzo and Scotty Yurk. I'm going to take you into a conversation that they had right here, and you can hear from Coach Yurk's mouth about getting exposure. See, Coach Yurk now is the head coach at Georgetown Prep. We play them, but before that, he was coaching in college as well, and these same exact principles apply today. So let's take a listen to see what he has to say. The first thing I want to talk about is exposure uh, for student athletes who are trying to get recruited to play in college. And lacrosse is predominantly an East Coast sport uh, at the collegiate level. There are some schools, Denver and a few others who are out in the West at the D1 level and some other D2s and D3s out West, but predominantly it's on the East Coast. Um, what do players, student athletes, high school players who are from non-traditional areas, you know, out West, parts of the Midwest, perhaps in the South, what can they do to overcome the geographic challenges that they face and how do they get the exposure that they want to be able to play in college? Sure, that's a great question. It's one I feel oftentimes from, from parents and kids. Um, the, the simple answer is you, you've got to make yourself, you need, you need to be able to get your name out there in, in however the, the best way for you is. And what do I mean by that? There's any number of avenues you can pursue. Um, the most basic is find some schools you're interested in and email their coaches and find out where they're going to be in the summer. Uh, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to pour your resources into a specific recruiting event that you're going to get to and be disappointed in who's there to view you. So if you have a couple places in mind that you have interest in potentially attending for college, reach out to their coaches, just ensure that they're going to be at those events or obviously proactively ask them where they're going to be and make your decision based on that. Um, most coaches will be pretty responsive to that if they get an, an email from a young man who's interested in their program and asking, again, where they might be uh, best view, they'll, they'll go ahead and give that advice pretty readily. All right, so the other big, big topic is players who are playing in a non-traditional lacrosse area. So I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the areas like DC or Baltimore or New York or upper state New York. I'm talking about places that, you know, just aren't known for being big lacrosse places. Places like some places in Texas, California, out west. I'll tell you, players come from everywhere. So Scotty's going to talk about that as well. Let's dive in, take a quick listen. Um, now, the, the sentiment amongst people who live in those non-traditional areas is that they're at a disadvantage. Is that any truth to that? or uh, Not necessarily. I mean, admittedly, if there's high-level high school lacrosse in, in um, Baltimore area, D.C. area, upstate New York, of course there's going to be more college coaches at those games because there's more universities within driving distance. But that being said, there are great players coming from all parts of the country. I mean, at, at all levels, very, very good players from, again, uh, several different programs uh, across the United States. And so um, ultimately, I don't find there to be a real disadvantage other than, again, the obvious exposure issues that we just discussed. And so you do have to do your due diligence. All right, to give you a little bit more background here, I've had BTB Lax now for about 10 years, make some YouTube videos, create content, write stuff on the blog. I've been coaching lacrosse now for 18 years now, eight years in college and 10 years at high level high school. One of the big things that people talk about, especially when trying to get recruited, is what camp should I go to? Well, we put together the lacrosse recruitment roadmap and inside there, we hooked up with Jim Berkman, the head coach at Salisbury. And Salisbury has won countless national championships. He's recruited hundreds of all Americans and he's gonna give you his advice for what camps you should attend. So let's take a listen. So as we're looking at tournaments and camps, um, I'm a parent or a player trying to decide where I'm gonna go. Um, obviously figuring out which camps the coaches of you know, the schools that you're interested in are in are gonna be at, that would be a factor. But 
How do I determine which camp is better than another, other than knowing where the coaches are going to be? Is it, or does, is that the, the sole factor? You know, it, the camps are ever changing. You, you know, when way back when you started, that you know, 205 used to be like the the only thing. You know, and now you go there, and it's uh, it's maybe the competition is quite as good as it used to be. And those things kind of seem to move from year to right. year, depending fluid, on yeah. the fluid fluidity of it. Um, but first of all, I would say that. You know, in regard to spending your money, everybody's only, in most cases, most of us only have a certain amount of money that we can put forth to, to this process. I would say that number one, playing on a good club team is, is important. I think a good club team, uh, in, in, number one, increases your lax IQ. He's got a good coach, he's teaching you how to play, and he's enthusiastic about you getting better. Um, and I think also when you play in a club team, you know, you, uh, you learn to play within a system, you see real lacrosse out there, I think that really helps your knowledge of the game. Um, then after the club thing, I think if, if you're, you need to go to a couple, maybe a couple things that's going to be really relevant to where the schools that you want to go to. Right. You know, if it's their prospect camp and these are the four you're going to go to, or if it's a certain individual showcase that's in New England because you want to go to a NESCAC school that you, you know all the NESCAC coaches are going to be there that you need to make an appearance there, especially if that's the type of school that you want to go to. How many tournaments or camps or prospect days would you recommend a, a prospect go to during the summertime? Well, I, I like a good mix. If me in a perfect world, I think it, that a, if a kid could play on a club team, that, that would be very important. And uh, But a club team with two, maybe three things. That was some great stuff there by Coach Berkman. And if you're looking to see even more, just click the link right in the description of this video. You can get your copy of the Lacrosse Recruitment Roadmap. All right, moving on. The next question I hear about a lot is, do late bloomers have any hope? Well, to give you a little bit more background here, you see, while I was coaching at Georgetown, I also coached with Matt Kerwick. And Coach Kerwick has been a head coach in Division One for three separate teams, Hobart, Cornell, and Jacksonville. And the same thing that he's going to tell you right now applies even today. So let's go in and take a listen about late bloomers. Um, what about student athletes who are juniors or seniors? Maybe they're a late bloomer or they just started playing lacrosse a couple years ago, but they're a good athlete. Is there any hope for those types of players or are they just not going to get recruited? Oh, there's definitely hope for that. And I, and I think everyone is pushing back on that right now. Um, you know, I think most programs are keeping one or two spots available and they'd be foolish if they didn't. And so, so that's how the us, co colleges are dealing with it. They're keeping a spot or two right. open for that late bloom. I, I think so. And everybody I speak with, they're doing the same thing that we've done. We've always been slower at Cornell, um, you know, but it, it, it's, it's definitely. That's due to the academic requirements. Not, more so than anything else. Right. Yes. We, we, we take things slower and, and two reasons. One, we want to as a coaching staff and two, uh, because of the academic rigors there. But um, it, it is it is getting challenging for, for young men to wait. And I, I think it, it, it'd be foolish not to you know wait as coaches, but I think it, it is getting more challenging for a young man that develops later, that maybe commits to uh, lacrosse his junior year. He decides he's not gonna be a division one hockey player or football player or soccer player, or whatever it might be in lacrosse. Uh, he gravitates that direction. So uh, we, we just try to keep a spot or two open. I think most programs are doing that now to, uh, to enable us to, to find that, that late bloomer. All right, so there's some great information for you in order to get exposure, what to do if you don't live in a traditional area, what camps to go to, and what to do if you're a late bloomer. All right, now the fifth tip I want to give you is about some administrative stuff that you want to think about when you're going through the recruiting process this summer. And one is emails. There is a specific format you want to use when emailing these coaches because you want to make sure you give them all the information. There's a dedicated video to this inside the lacrosse recruitment roadmap. So you can check that out if you want all the information. But the basic gist is you want to tell them where you're going to be and you want to give them all your academic information so they can tell what kind of a student you are. That's very, very important. Secondly, you want to provide film to these guys. You want to make sure that they have a full game of where you're playing against good competition and it's highlighting all your different skills that you offer as a lacrosse player. And third, there's some dead periods this summer, specifically July 2nd through the 6th 
in the whole month of August where Division I coaches cannot talk to you. So keep an eye on those periods if you're thinking of scheduling any visits or whatnot during that time. All right, so I hope these five tips were useful for you because they're big, big topics that I hear players talking about all the time. And real quick, guys, if you like these types of videos, go ahead, give it a like. Make sure you subscribe to my channel so you can get notified when I put out more videos. And also, I put together a free lacrosse training series. The link is right in the description of this video. If you want to get a copy of it, just click the link and put in your email, and I'll send it right over to your inbox. This is Coach Miller with BTB Lax. Talk soon.